Alfred Eisenstadt has seen every day of the 20th century, and much of what he's seen, we've seen through his photographs, most often in the pages of the venerable Life magazine. Lisa Rudolph has the story of a man whose reputation for capturing this century's most captivating moments was sealed with a kiss. Good evening, this is your S.O. Reporter with latest NBC News pictures. Tonight, we bring you highlights of the citywide demonstration as caught by NBC Newsreel cameras. VJ Day, 1945, and the news of victory overseas swept over New York's Times Square. Yes, sir, Times Square is quite a place. Into this human sea of frenzied emotion waded one man, barely over five feet tall, with one camera, who saw one kiss. And in one split second, captured an image for all time a symbol of the nation's euphoria. I have talked about this picture about 10,501 times already. That's it? Yes. <laughs> Only 10,501 times? What shall I say? Everybody knows it. it you may not favorite. remember his name, but you can't forget his faces. The most famous and infamous of the 20th century, defining people and moments brought into the living rooms of a generation by Life magazine and one of its first staff photographers, Alfred Eisenstadt. And what many may not realize is the man considered the father of photojournalism is still working after seven decades in his office in Manhattan's Time Life Building. Izzy, you still come to work every day. You're 95 years old. 95 and a half. 95 and a half, excuse me. When are you going to retire? You want to know when? <clears throat> when I really can't work anymore when I'm dead. His love affair with the camera has produced an extraordinary body of work and made Eisenstadt, or Izzy as his friends call him, a living legend in the field of photography. You have an amazing career. Cool. 2,500 assignments. At least. 86 live covers, a million pictures, more photos published than any photographer alive. True. Does that amaze you? This amazes me, yes. Do you consider yourself an artist or a journalist? I'm neither an artist nor a journalist. I'm a simple photographer. Eisenstadt literally has been a chronicler of life. From the worlds of music, literature, art, and theater, to science, sports, and politics. Eisenstadt's own history is as colorful as his subjects. He was born in 1898 in what is now Poland to an upper middle class Jewish family. He got his first camera at the age of 14, but soon lost interest. At 17, Eisenstadt was drafted into the German army in World War I and was badly wounded. He returned to Berlin to become, in his words, one of the worst button salesmen ever. And he took up photography again. This time, his hobby became his passion. And you never looked back. Never looked back. What was that position for a second? And photography never looked the same. Now, instead of doing this, like this, okay. like this, what's that? Eisenstadt was one of the first to abandon the stiff, posed pictures of the day for the immediacy and realism of candids, shot in natural light with the newly invented 35mm camera. When I photograph people, I'm not nervous. I talk to them, and I talk alone, and I have only one little camera and no lights. That's it? Yeah. That's all you used? M3E number one. What's that E stand for? E for Eisenstadt. Eisenstadt, one critic wrote, is a master of the little detail that tells a big story. Ordinary people at extraordinary moments. Like one of Izzy's personal favorites, the Children's Puppet Theater in Paris, 1929. I found a little, some kind of a mouse hole under the stage. And I crawled under, nobody could see me, and I photographed the exact moment the dragon was slain. People remember me. I get letters every day. 
from the very famous to simple admirers like the one whose letter arrived the day of our visit. Spent my name wrong. Oh, it I'm says not world's the greatest, greatest photographer. No. no and I you're complaining about how they spelled your name? I don't want to be a star. I'm one of the boys. Someone described you as a little big man with a camera. I'm a little, little man with a camera. <laughs> <laughs> A little man with a large and wonderful legacy. Dean Arbus was born in 1923 and died in 1971. I remember just recently being absolutely amazed at the difference between rich people and poor people because I think it tremendously influences their attitude toward money and toward a lot of other things. Who are we is the basic question that Arbus asks over and over. First of all, I was a very grubby kid and not very attractive, sort of dirty. And the family fortune always seemed to me humiliating. I mean, we lived on Park Avenue in the 90s and uh, Center Park West in the 70s. The outside world was so far from us, so inimical, and not in the sense of that it was evil, but that it was simply, um, you know, the doors were shut, that was all. And for so long I lived that way, as if there was a kind of contagion somewhere. You know, you get hints of the outside world, like, for instance, elevator men become a peculiar clue to really what's going on. Her brother, Howard Nemiroff, was one of the most erudite poets of the second half of the 20th century. She was perceived as a magazine photographer in the 50s and 60s. She photographs children's fashions for the Sunday Times magazine. She and her husband had a fashion photography business. One of the things I felt I suffered from was that I never felt adversity. For instance, I never even knew I was Jewish because I grew up, you know, in a very Jewish a city in a very Jewish community where my father was a rich Jew. I was confirmed in the sense of unreality, which I only could feel as a sense of unreality. I've resolutely traveled downward on the ladder. The book presents to us how she worked. Her subjects were ones that she actually knew, that even those people that you think she just met on this street and made one portrait of and then never saw again, she actually got to know. And that she met Eddie Carmel, the Jewish giant, years before the photograph that we know and had photographed him in different situations. She kept elaborate lists of whole classes of individuals, not just eccentric types, I just have never believed that, that photographs are very useful to anybody but me. I mean, my photographs. I suppose I think it'd be nice to keep them, because I do think I have some slight corner on something about the quality of things. Why she took her life will probably forever remain a mystery. Dune Arbus says it really quite beautifully. She writes, uh, her suicide seems neither inevitable nor spontaneous neither perplexing nor intelligible. The photograph, as she says, is much less important or interesting than the experience. And I think it's a good lesson for us today in this world where we are surrounded by images to remember that the depth of experience is what comes through in great art, and it's not just subject. I think there are things that nobody would see unless I photograph them.
My name is Maya Benton. I'm an adjunct curator at the International Center of Photography in New York, and we're going to be talking today about the Roman Vishniak retrospective, Roman Vishniak Rediscovered. Roman Vishniak is responsible for taking the most widely recognized, most widely reproduced photographic record of Jewish life in Eastern Europe between the two world wars. What's unknown is that his work actually spans the early 1920s into the late 1970s. And so this exhibition shows his iconic work and repositions it in a different context, but also really introduces a life's work and I think makes the argument for him being one of the great photographers of the 20th century. Vishniak was born in 1897 in a town called Pavlovsk outside of St. Petersburg, and then he was raised in Moscow. And when he was seven years old, he was given a camera and a microscope. And he became an avid amateur photographer. At the same time, he was an avid student of biology and chemistry and zoology. He arrived in Berlin with his new wife, Luta, who was a Latvian Jewish woman, in 1920. And he quickly joined amateur camera clubs and took to the street documenting this cosmopolitan city and experimenting with modernism. And in one of the photos, you see a train station and it looks like a Fritz Long stage set. And you see the influence of this Weimar light and shadow play and you see the strong angles and you see the influence of the context in which he was becoming a professional photographer. In one photo, there's a, um, an image of the polar bears, the famous polar bears at the Berlin Zoo, but it looks like the people are behind bars. And this image is quite poignant because shortly after he took the image, Jews were prohibited from going to the Berlin Zoo. And shortly thereafter, Vishniak started to document the Nazi rise to power in Berlin. And this is a body of work, most of which has never been published. And it's an incredible documentation of how quickly things changed from this very open, intellectual, cosmopolitan Weimar uh, society to one where um, militarism and fascism were closing in. Two images that were often uh, reproduced and published are photos he took of his daughter, Mara, in 1933. In one, she's standing in front of a Nazi phrenology shop, um, advertising the superiority of the Aryan race and providing certificates. You could say, that, you know, I have an Aryan skull and I am indeed an Aryan. And in another, she's standing in front of a poster um, of Hindenburg and Hitler, and we managed to find the original poster. Vishniak was sent in 1935 by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which was the world's and is still the world's largest Jewish relief organization, to take photos of poor, destitute Eastern Jews so that those images could be used to show potential philanthropists in the West. And then the war hit, and this became the final photographic record of that world.
now celebrating a unique lens to see life. Amna Nawaz remembers one of the most influential photographers of the 20th century, part of our Canvas series. I'm for a good picture. He was best known for vividly capturing America's quirks and spotlighting the country's social divisions in everyday life. Robert Frank was born in Switzerland to a wealthy European Jewish family, but he was decidedly an American, one who managed to maintain an outsider's point of view. As he himself noted in the 2015 documentary about his career, don't blink. I tried not to talk to them and I didn't want them to talk to me. Frank immigrated to New York in 1947 and started work at Harper's Bazaar, but he soon became aware of many of the stark contrasts in American society. That perspective was a driving force behind his most celebrated work, 1957's The Americans. Starting in 1955, Frank crisscrossed the country, snapping 28,000 photos in just two years, ultimately culling them down to a collection of just 83. His work was in sharp contrast to more traditional, optimistic photos of the time. Frank reflected on that work in Don't Blink. When I look at the ADC photographs I choose for the book, I think they really got the essence. Like this shot of motorcyclists in Indianapolis, a trolley car in New Orleans, and a political rally in Chicago. And it turns Sarah Greeno is the director of photography at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. She knew Frank and says the Americans revealed a country that was plagued by racism and consumerism. He looked beneath the surface, seeing these um, ills in American society, but he also um, photographed novel areas of beauty within the country, um, subjects that other photographers hadn't previously looked at, such as cars, diners, and even the road itself. Greeno says the book also made Frank's unique artistic style influential. Many of them have a sort of fast, seemingly intuitive look, as if he just turned around um, and captured uh, the image. They're often um, off kilter, which gives a great sense of dynamism to them. The book, The Americans, was initially reviled by the critics, but it very quickly uh, became embraced by a younger generation of photographers and, and then others. Frank's work featured other cultural icons of the day. He befriended beat writer Jack Kerouac shortly after compiling The Americans, and Kerouac later wrote the book's foreword. And Frank's black and white photos were featured on the cover of the Rolling Stones' critically acclaimed 1972 album, Exile on Main Street. Later in his career, Frank continued to shoot photos and film, largely focusing his lens on America's least privileged rather than the powerful. Robert Frank died Monday in Nova Scotia. He was 94 years old. And there's more online where we take a closer look at one of Frank's most enduring images from his book, The Americans. That's on our website, pbs.org slash newshour. And that is the News Hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff for all of us at the PBS News Hour. Thank you, and we'll see you soon.